we're going to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. <coughs> but before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place. Kevin Spacey's new do, movie, no. Once or twice every week. So if that's of interest to you, please gently pull up oh, behind wait. the like button. Dude, I've just noticed this entire time. I don't have Chatterino up. I felt like something was off today, man. I, I, I felt it. There was something off, and I finally figured it out. This vid came out five days ago. Button at a red light, and the instant it turns green, immediately lay on your horn. I knew there was to something the off. Like button up. Also, please subscribe to our I channel forgot you and guys. turn I'm on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. Dude, chat. Chris Brown still is a successful musician even after beating the shit out of Rihanna. You know what I mean? Like. But to be fair, Amber's not a good actor, so. And she did get a role in Aquaman because of Johnny, so maybe she won't get many roles at all. <clears throat> at 7.20 p.m. on Friday, January 12th, 2007, 19-year-old college freshman Wade Steffi walked into Ford Dining Hall, which is one of five I had dining hair halls like that on when I was younger. University's campus. Purdue is a <laughs> prestigious American university located in Indiana that is known for its excellent athletics and academics. Wade, who was an aviation technology student and was at Purdue on a full academic scholarship, grabbed some food and then sat down at a table with some friends. This was the first Friday of the 2007 spring semester, and so Wade and his friends at the table and the hundreds of other students that were sitting all around Purdue them chicken. were buzzing with excitement about what they were up to that night and what they were up to that weekend. And so Wade and yeah, his friends they sat there yeah. chatting about their plans for about an hour. I love college. And then at around 8.20 p.m., Wade experience. realized he needed to leave. And so he stood up, he said goodbye to his friends, he carried his tray to the trash can, and then he made his... Actually, my college experience was at a community college, so it felt like just a, just a high school. Just like high school where you can... Uh, walk around freely. That's basically all it was. <clears throat> his way out of the doors he came in on. And so once he was outside of the dining hall, yeah, he debt immediately for life. turned right and walked <clears throat> a very short distance to the building that was right next to Ford Dining Hall. And so that building was called Owen Hall, and it was a dormitory. Now, this was not Wade's dormitory. He actually lived in a different dorm called Kerry Quad West, which was located on the other side of Ford Dining Hall. And so Wade goes inside of Owen Hall because he has some friends in there, and he makes his way to their room, and when he goes inside, he sees they're all kind of sitting around chatting and drinking some alcoholic drinks. And so Wade sits down, and he has a couple of drinks, and he just hangs out and being with his irresponsible, friends for about fair an hour. Enough. And so around 9 30 p.m wade and the other people he was with in this room they left owen hall and they walked the half mile away from campus to the west to this huge party at a fraternity and so wade would stay at this fraternity for several hours until about midnight at which point he pulled one of his friends aside and he told them that he just remembered he had left his jacket inside of owen hall and so he wanted to go <clears throat> back and retrieve it the dorms on purdue's campus all lock at night and so the only way you can get inside is if you live there and so you have a key or if you know someone who lives there who will open the door for you. And so during his walk back to Owen Did Hall, Wade would make in, six in a way? phone calls in an attempt to get <laughs> someone in Owen Hall to open the door for him. But oh, four he's gonna, of his phone okay. calls would just be the wrong happening. number. And so the people that were picking up and he was asking to open the door, they didn't know what he was talking about. And so they hung up. But he did call two people that did live inside Just Owen call Hall. Owen. However, yeah, where's they Owen? didn't answer their phones. And so around 12.30 a.m., Wade arrived at Owen Hall. He put his phone back in his pocket, and he just walked up to the doors, which were locked, and he just started knocking. And eventually, a resident of Owen Hall, who didn't know Wade, and Wade didn't know them, they heard the knocking, and they came out to the door to see what was going on, and they looked through the glass, and they saw Wade, and apparently, they decided that Wade looked too intoxicated to let into the building and so they refused him entry and so wade apparently stood there he kept knocking for a little bit but he eventually just kind of gave up he turned around well that's kind away. of rude fast forward a few what? days to <clears throat> tuesday january 6th okay wait it, okay so he wants to go to his dorm but they didn't let him in because he looked drunk what it's his dorm go look at the plants i sent i'm very excited Oh, 
Oh, they look way better now, yeah. 16th, and Wade's rumor <coughs> would actually Thank you, on no. all the past weekend. He returned, and the first thing he noticed when he got back to his dorm was that Wade was not in the dorm. And so he called and texted Wade, but he Here didn't we get go. a response. Just because so they didn't he let him in. went out around the floor that they lived on to ask people if they had seen Wade. Oh, he's going to the dining hall to get his jacket. Oh, okay. Okay. Then no one had seen him since <clears throat> the previous Friday. And so starting to get pretty concerned, the roommate called Wade's family to see if maybe they knew what was going on with him, but his family had no idea. And so by the end of that day, the police had been contacted about Wade potentially being missing. And they in turn contacted Wade's cell phone provider and they were- Classic flip phone. Uh, that's probably not something I should be focusing on right now, but able to determine that Wade's cell phone was still showing up somewhere on Purdue's campus, although oh, we couldn't no. figure out exactly where. So that evening, a massive campus-wide search was launched with hundreds of police officers and volunteers. Oh, wow. Even the school's equestrian club came out with their horses to search the nearby woods. But despite this huge search effort that would go the on hell? for several weeks, the only thing they would find think people of Wade's actually cared. was one of his shoes. It was found on January 20th, so just four days into the search, and it was located right outside of an exterior door that led into a maintenance room inside of Owen Hall. Hall. But when they searched this maintenance room, Wade wasn't in there. Finally, after nearly a month of searching, when they still had not oh, found no. Wade, the official search was called off. On March 19th, roughly two months after Wade had been reported oh, missing, no. a maintenance worker was downstairs <clears throat> in the laundry room of Owen Hall when they heard a strange popping sound. At first, the worker thought it was actually coming from one of the washers or dryers that was on, and you know, maybe there's a loose coin or some piece of metal that uh, was inside of the washer or dryer that's uh, getting banged around inside, and that's making the sound. And so this worker began walking uh, around the laundry room, kind of listening in to each of the washers and dryers that were on to see if they were making this sound. And so as he's doing this, he hears the popping sound again, but it's clearly not coming from oh, any of the washers stop and Stop making the noises. In fact, it's not stop. even coming from inside the laundry room. <clears throat> it's coming from somewhere out in the hall. Curious, he leaves the laundry room and he goes out into the hall. And as soon as he's standing in the hall, he hears the popping sound again. And this time it was obvious that it was coming from behind the closed door that was directly opposite the laundry room. So the worker pulled out his big set of keys. He opened the door that was directly in front of him and he stepped inside. Moments later, he would make a big discovery. Based on that discovery and the investigation that would follow it, uh. this is a reconstruction of what happened to Wade Steffi. In the early morning hours of January 13th, right uh. after Wade had been denied entry into Owen Hall because the student who was in there who didn't know him thought he was too intoxicated, right after that happened, Wade left the front doors and made his way around to the left side of the building to I look for another way in inside. And when he got to the left side of the building, he found another door. Now, even though this door did not have a sign on it that said, keep out, it was fairly obvious that this door was not designed for students to use. There was a metal railing that lined the outside of this door, clearly oh, no. to prevent pedestrians from getting <clears throat> to the door. Oh, and the door itself was actually Fell not into the built funny room. at ground level. It basically was built at the <clears throat> He might have went to level. the back rooms, guys. So you'd be standing at this railing looking down at the door. And down in front of the door was a slab of cement right out in front of it that gave the door enough clearance to be able to open. And so basically there was a railing around a pit and that was where the door was. The proper way to get to this door was to literally climb over that railing and jump down into this pit. And then you'd need a key to open the store because it was always locked. Well, it was supposed to always be locked. And so when Wade saw this what? clearly off limits door on the side of Owen Hall, in his drunken state, he decided it would be a good idea to try to go into it because in his mind, he thought, you know, whatever is he behind fell? this door no, doesn't really didn't. matter. As long as I can just get he, he went into the back room. some That's part what happened. of Owen Hall, I can find my way up to my friend's room and I can get my jacket. And so he rushes over to the railing. He climbs over. He leaps down into that pit area. He grabs the 
the doorknob of this off-limits door and he pulls on it and it's open. So he opens it up, he steps inside and it's totally pitch black. And all he can hear is the sound of machines humming and whirring in the darkness. Oh, no. And again, in his <clears throat> drunken state, he decides this is still a good idea. His oh, only concern no. was he couldn't find a light switch, and it really some, was. He's gonna fall in. He's gonna fall into some fucking machine, dude. What happened to the verdict stream? We're waiting. We're waiting. It's on the side. I'm, yeah. I'm, I've and been he keeping was worried, an eye on it. Once the door shut, <clears throat> not only would his only light source be totally cut off, yeah, he about to get but grinded. It might bro. actually lock behind him, and then he'd be trapped inside of this room. And so he took off one of his shoes and he tucked it in the door jam of the door he came in on to keep it open. And so with the door propped open behind him, he began walking into this room. And pretty much right away, he bumped into this big metal structure. He couldn't see what it was because, again, it was too uh. dark. But he could feel it and he could tell, you know, it was a flat metal structure. It felt like a machine of some kind. And oh, he could no. hear that it was one of the machines that was buzzing <laughs> and whirring. And so he just decided he would try to walk around it because, again, his goal is just to get through this room. Yeah, it's going to be like a, another like door a somewhere. A huge and kind of trash compactor or some shit to the dorm. And so Wade began moving his way left along this machine. Oh, God, kind a of fan, don't say that. Come to a stop at some point and then he could walk around it. But it would turn out this machine was very big, very wide. And so by the time he actually got to the left edge of this machine, he was practically right up against the wall of the room he was in. And when he got there, he realized the space between the side of the machine and the wall of the room was big enough that if he turned sideways, he could basically squeeze his way. But why? <clears throat> Just because you can. Why? You know what I mean? Like, it's one of, just because you can. You know, why? You know? <laughs> <laughs> We're drinking water so while So I think the confusion stop. came in this particular oh God, one because the statement in question is the title of thank the op-ed. Uh, thank you for so 100 bits, Lodgy. Whether it's the whole op-ed or just... Okay, all right, just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hanky Pie. Peasant starve. Dying while being stuck is like my top fear. Dying while being stuck? Yeah, like in a claustrophobic... Oh, yeah, like, oh. 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 Dude, that would be like one of the worst ways to go, like being in a claustrophobic... Air. Like, the one... I think the one that I hated the most is when someone got stuck in a chimney and then died. Like, that would be awful. Way past it. Now, he had no idea how far into the room this strange machine went, <clears> but <throat> in his drunken state, he decided it was a good idea. And so yeah. he turns sideways, so his back that is makes to the sense. wall of the room, and his chest is going to be facing the machine, and he begins pushing himself into that narrow... That's why I own a gun that I carry with me. One shot in the head is better than starving or being tortured somehow. Yeah, but like you got like the person who fell down the chimney, you can't reach your gun. Like you're fucked. Like like they they were stuck like this. Like they couldn't do anything. Like you couldn't move. Like you you're you're just you're fucked. But to be fair, like most people are smart enough uh not to go down a chimney. So you know space and so as he's making his way his or, hands are or off, squeezed kind of in, in, in between neck. two and at some point, machines he kind of begins to trip now he didn't actually fall because he's basically wedged into this tight space but for a second he reflexively grabbed with his hands onto this machine right in front of him and just by chance his left ring finger slipped into a very narrow hole that was about two inches deep the room that wade was inside of was called an electrical vault and it contained six large transformers, one of which Wade's finger had just stuck inside of. The job of these six transformers uh... is to take the high voltage they receive from the main power <clears throat> grid and then transform it, hence the name, into lower usable voltage that gets dispersed into Owen Hall for residents and teachers. Even though the outside of these transformers had mostly been covered with protective materials that mitigated the electrocution risk, there were still several parts of these machines that there was just nothing you could do. They just presented a really high electrocution risk. 
And one of those sections you needed to be extra careful with was that two inch hole that Wade's finger at least he died quickly. Of. At the don't back be too, of that don't hole be too quick. was an exposed electrical <clears throat> conductor. And the second the tip of his finger touched that conductor, between 2,000 and 4,000 volts of electricity would pump into his body. For reference, when people get executed via the electric chair, they are electrocuted with 2,000 volts of electricity. Wade likely died instantly. Oh, but okay, good. Because of the fact right. that he was kind of wedged <clears throat> between the transformer and the wall, after he died, he didn't just slump onto the ground. Instead, he remained in a semi upright position with his finger still stuck inside of that hole. And so, for the next two months, his body just continued to be electrocuted every second. Finally, sometime in March, as a result of Wade's body fluids draining out of him, the electrical current that was being pumped into him altered its course and began snapping outside of his skin into the ground. And so, the sound of the electrical current actually striking the ground was that popping sound oh, that the maintenance worker heard. Extra the door crispy. that the maintenance oh. worker opened in order to investigate oh, the sound was the only oh. other door that led into the electrical vault, the other being the exterior <clears throat> door that Wade had gone in on. Initially, when the worker opened that door and looked inside of the vault, he actually didn't see Wade, but he smelled something funny, and that was what led him to walk into the room and make his way around, and that's when he spotted Wade's body. Earlier, on January 20th, when they found Wade's shoe, which at some point had just slipped out of the door jamb, so it was not propping open the exterior door when it was found, <coughs> it was just sitting in that pit area, and the exterior door was shut. And so when they found that shoe, the police, they did go inside of the electrical vault, but they didn't go in through the exterior door. They went around and went in the same door that the maintenance worker opened Why? from right across the hall from the laundry room. I feel so bad and for when people that discover up, these they scenes. Just God, I into know. The room. They didn't walk into the room. They just looked from the doorway, and from their perspective, they couldn't see Wade. And so that was why initially they had said, you know, Wade is not inside of that room. They, they looked in and like, yeah, it looks good. No bodies. I know we found his shoe. I know we found his fucking shoe, but he's probably not here. Ultimately, <clears throat> because that exterior door to the electrical vault was supposed to be locked at all times, and clearly it was not because that's how Wade got in, Purdue was found to be negligent, and so they agreed to pay Wade's family $500,000, and they also set up a scholarship in Wade's name. God damn. <clears throat> Before we get into- they, they set up a scholarship in Wade's name? Imagine getting a scholarship. Yeah, bro, I got the Wade scholarship. Yo, is that the scholarship with the dude who got electrocuted for two months straight and turned into jerky? Yeah, I got that scholarship. <laughs> well, you got the scholarship of the dude who got brutally uh, uh, massacred by an electric current? Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, I got that one. <clears throat> you think the guy that locked him out should be held accountable? Who locked him out? Who locked him out? <clears throat> Yeah, give me that one. Listen, I'll take any scholarship. Respect the grind. Fair enough. Fair enough. <clears throat> Our next story, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. When I first sought out the starting uh -oh. the process, then I would highly... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. He doesn't know, chat. He doesn't know. During the California gold rush of 1848, <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of Americans living on the east coast of the United States packed up their things in covered wagons and headed west for California to attempt to 1800s. quite literally strike gold. About a year after the rush started, so in the winter of 1848. Oh no, hope no one, nobody dies. Yeah, every time I start a ball in video, the first thing I say is, oh geez, I hope no one dies in this video. <laughs> oh boy, I hope. I hope no one dies. <laughs> Every time I start a ball in video. <clears throat> 49, a group of about 100 Your would birth be year, right? Okay, fuck you. were on their way across the continental United States to California when they got lost in this totally barren stretch of desert, roughly 500 miles from their destination, which was San Francisco. 
They would spend the next two months driving around this desert looking for a way out, but they wouldn't find it. And so finally, they just stopped, set up camp, and waited to die. But as a last ditch effort, they sent ahead two of their fittest men to try to go out and find help. And miraculously, those two men would find help, and it wasn't long before the Happy lost ending? pioneers were going up and over <clears> this mountain pass. When is the out verdict? The desert, I have no idea. Whenever so the jury the decides, pioneers are cresting this mountain. One of the pioneers to be dead, turns and looks down know. at the desert valley below, where they almost all died. And he famously said, "Goodbye, Death Valley," and the name stuck. While well, Death Valley has since become a very popular tourist destination. Okay, that's a, that's a cool history lesson. I didn't know that's why it was called Death Valley. That's cool. For adventurous people, <clears throat> it is still truly one of the harshest environments on the planet. In addition to just being a big open desert, which presents a whole host of problems to any mammal, Death Valley also becomes one of the hottest places on the planet every summer. The temperatures soar to 120 degrees Fahrenheit Sheesh. and sometimes get as high as 136 Sheesh. degrees Fahrenheit. It's the kind of place where if you don't respect it, it will kill you. In 2005, a 35 year old man named Robert Darmer, who lived in Los Angeles, California, decided he wanted to take a trip into Death Valley. Specifically, he wanted to go. Hey, honey, <clears throat> where do you want to go on a trip? Oh, I don't know. I, I guess we could go to like, you know, like the Grand Canyon, maybe like the Rocky Mountains. You know, maybe we go to Disneyland or, you know, just go to the beach or something like that. You know what I want to do? I'll go to Death Valley. I want to go. I want to go to Death Valley. You mean the place that's just a barren desert that reaches extremely hot temperatures that potentially could kill you? Yeah, I just feel you know. Let's take a vacation out there. I, I think it's gonna be a fun thing. You know, who does that? Who the hell does that? No, no normal person does that. Go to the hot springs <clears throat> located in the northwest corner of Death Valley, and actually, there's a nudist resort that is right around those hot springs. And so, Robert oh. wanted to go check that whole scene out. And so, on July, check that whole. He wants to check that whole scene out. I see what you're doing. I see what he's doing, chat. Like thirty-something year old man wants to go out to a nudist resort. Let's be real; it's mostly dudes. Let's be real, chat. Come on. Most people who go to a nudist resort is just dudes hanging dong. <clears throat> 26th of that year, Robert left Los Angeles. There's nothing wrong with wagon that. Van, I'd be down with that. North about four I'd hours like to see until it. he got to Bishop, Compare. California, which is a you small know? town where some of his family lived. After spending the night with them, the next morning when Robert got up, he got back into his van and he drove south about 20 minutes to a town called Zurich, California, where he picked up Death Valley Road. This road covers the entirety of Death Valley, starting from its northern entrance, Horny where Robert AF. was, all the way <clears throat> south. 140 miles to its southern entrance and okay imagine this though like okay I, I okay we'll get back to you know the uh, imagine this man is just like a reddit moderator and he's never touched a girl or seen a girl naked besides just like you know looking it up online what if he realized the only way he'd ever see a, a booby is if he goes to a nudist resort in death valley I run, man, I'm running out of options. I've, I've, I haven't seen a titty. I've never seen a real titty before. I'm running out of options, man. Fuck it, I'm going to Death Valley. I'm going to Death Valley, man, fuck it. This road is actually basically a straight line. But <clears throat> off of this very straight road are literally hundreds of miles of unpaved so roads down bad. that splinter off in all directions across the desert. And these roads bring people to other points of interest, like, for example, the nudist resort that Robert wanted to go to. So after Robert hopped onto the Death Valley Road at its northern entrance, he began driving south for about an hour, and then he began looking for the turnoff to the unpaved road that would take him the last 50 miles to the nudist resort. And so eventually, Robert 
believes he's found this turnoff. Uh -oh. And so he gets onto this unpaved road and he starts driving uh -oh. for a while. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> his car just sinks down into the ground and it won't budge. Oh. It would turn out Robert had made a mistake. He had not turned onto the correct unpaved road. Oh, Instead, he had picked no. a road that led right out onto this salt flat. And so to the naked eye, it would have looked like the ground in front of him was totally flat and hard packed and you could easily walk on or drive on it. But in reality, the surface of the salt flat is very brittle. And underneath that brittle surface is this thick section of mud. And so before Robert could realize his mistake, he had broken through the surface layer of the salt flat and got stuck in that mud. After trying well, unsuccessfully to get his van back out again, <clears throat> Robert realized he was in a really bad situation. His cell phone had no reception, so he couldn't contact anyone, and he was too far away to attempt to walk to the nearest civilization to try to get help. But luckily, uh -oh. he had packed lots and lots of water that was in his van, and so he decided the only thing he could do was just sit tight at his van, ration out his water, and this wait for happy someone ending, on right? Death Valley Road to look out and see him and come to his rescue. But after waiting for six days, no one saw him. And now his water supply was dwindling, and so Robert decided his only option was to abandon his van and make the walk to civilization. <clears throat> see... That's what you should have done in the first place. If he realized that he'd only had six days of water, why wouldn't he just go? You know? Like, wouldn't that be the better option? Because at least, you know, in, instead of waiting until you literally have nothing left, why, why wouldn't you just go when you had all that shit? And so he packed up all the water he could, he threw it on his back, and he began to walk. And just like the lost pioneers <clears throat> in 1849, at the very last second, Robert was rescued. As oh. he stumbled across the desert, oh. his canteen empty, this group of teenage boys and a few adults who were part of this group called the League of Venturers were out in Death Valley doing search and rescue training. And so they oh. literally turned onto the oh. same road that Robert accidentally turned onto and oh. then got stuck on. And so they came down and found Robert. And Robert, when he saw them, he was hysterical. He was crying tears of joy. He really believed he was going to die probably that day. And so the League of Venturers, they take Robert into their van and they drive him 80 miles to the Holy nearest shit. ranger station. And <clears throat> as soon as Robert got out of the car, he dropped to his knees and he kissed the ground in appreciation. I mean, this guy really was that close to death. That evening, God Robert damn. would get a ride from the ranger station back to Bishop, California. And the next morning, Robert spoke with a local towing company, and they agreed to drive him out into Death Valley to locate his van <laughs> and tow it back Yo. out again. But when they got out there and they found his... No. Don't. Don't tell me that they get trapped too. And the towing company saw that the van was not in good shape. It had two flat tires and there were several other mechanical issues with it. <clears throat> and they told Robert, look, we can't tow it out until the repairs are made and we can't make those repairs right now. And so they left the van. We can't tow it out until the repairs are made. What? <clears throat> okay. Am I stupid? Do, do, do you what so so when there's a wreck and a car turns into a ball of metal a towing company looks at it nah we got to repair that first then we could tow it we got we got to we got to bring it back to to brand new and then we'll tow it huh <laughs> yeah your tail lights out can't tow it oh you got a flat tire sorry we we can't tow flat tires yeah sorry man we can't tow you <clears throat> What the hell? <laughs> and where it was, and they drove Robert back to Bishop. And then when they got there, Robert, who was quite handy with his van, decided he would just make the repairs himself. No, Robert, you dumb, dumb idiot. Oh my God, you're joking. He's gonna die, isn't he? He's gonna fucking die, isn't he? And so he went around town, he gathered up all the supplies he would need, and then that evening, he got a local young couple to give him a ride back. Don't, don't do this to him. Don't, don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna get my tools and go get my car myself. I'm a handyman.
Would you say he's bad to the bone? Back into Death Valley. Robert had told his family right before he left that his plan was to go and fix his van and then that night come back to business. Up, and then the next day he would contact the towing company again and they could come out and they could get his van out but that night robert did not come back to bishop and the next morning when his family still had not heard from him or seen him they guys he's dead okay he's dead just stop like he's are he's already dead it's over it's over he's already dead guys This was a mistake adding the sound effect. <coughs> Cease. 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 Bruh. Cease. 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 They contacted authorities. It would take a few days, but... Am I going to get copyright claimed? I wonder if I get copyright claimed. Just for the intro. The authorities <clears throat> would eventually figure out what happened to Robert. The young couple that gave Robert a ride back into Death Valley, they dropped him off at this intersection right off of Death Valley Road, where they and Robert believed was only about a mile away from that nudist resort that Robert had originally wanted to go to. Robert Why wouldn't they just take him to the car? Had told the couple that his plan was just to walk from that point. He would go to that <coughs> resort and he would recruit somebody else to drive him the rest of the way to the van. He could make the repairs and that person would drive him back and that would be it. So Robert got out. He said thank you to the couple and he waved to them as they drove off. And then he stashed his van supplies and then turned away from Death Valley Road and began walking along this unpaved road into the desert. However, unbeknownst to Robert or to the couple, the spot he was dropped off was the wrong spot. He oh my god, Robert, you are so fucking bad with directions. What uh, is his problem? He wants to die at this point. Robert frantically fixing uh, his broke-ass car. Do it for the titties. Do it for... <laughs> He's just listening to, to Bad to the Bone the entire walk down to the nudist beach. Like, ah. Uh. I may, I may have almost died, but that's not going to stop me from seeing some titties. He was not a mile or less away from this resort. He was about 15 miles away from this resort, and the path was fairly circuitous. So even if he knew the distance, he likely would not have been able to even navigate his way there. And so after wandering down this unpaved road for about 10 miles, Robert left the unpaved road and began heading out into open desert, likely seeking water. Robert would eventually collapse and die just four days after he had been rescued from the exact same situation when his body <sighs> ooh savage burn does it count as a happy ending if he got rescued and then killed himself? We'll count it. We'll count it. We'll count it as a happy ending. <clears throat> All right. It was his fault. Like, you can't, even feel, you can't even feel bad for the guy. Like, come on. You can't even feel bad for him. But he was found. He didn't have a GPS. Died doing for what he loved. Looking for nude people to help him fix his car. <laughs> Dude, there's so many things he could have done that that would have prevented this. It, it's insanity. Or a map or <sighs> even a container for water. What? Did he want to die? I don't understand. In late 2002, 25-year-old <clears throat> Jason Chase yeah, the worked verdict as is still, a sheep uh, hasn't happened yet. We're waiting. Gisborne, which is located in the northeastern section of New Zealand. 
When Jason wasn't working, he was often on his bike, cycling up and down the coast, preparing for his next road race. In early December of that year, Jason contacted his family, who lived in a small town called Danaverk, which is located about 200 miles southwest of Gisborne, and he told them that he wanted to come visit them for Christmas. However, he didn't know exactly when he would actually arrive at their house, because his training and work schedule were fairly hectic, but he told them, don't worry, I will be there at least on Christmas day, December 25th, or a couple of days earlier. His family was thrilled, and they said, no problem, we can't wait to see you whenever that is. And so by the time mid-December rolled around, and Jason still had not arrived at his family's home in Danaverk, his family wasn't concerned at all. However, that would soon change. On December 13th, a hunter was driving along the many winding back roads of the Ruahine mountain range. This mountain range, which is located about Damn. eight miles north <clears throat> of Danaverk, is a very isolated and rugged wilderness area that's full of steep gorges and gullies and very thick brush. And so oh, as no. this hunter rounds the turn on this road, he looks up ahead and he sees there's a car parked on the side of the road. And so this hunter pulls up right alongside this car and he looks over and he can tell you know there's no one inside of it there's no obvious damage to the car and then the hunter began kind of scanning around the area to see if there was some obvious reason someone would stop right at that particular spot but when he looked around all he saw was thick trees on either side and the mountain kind of sloped down on either side chat this isn't a real photo this is a fake picture this picture doesn't exist just want everyone to know that and so there was nothing unique about the spot. And so something just kind of struck the hunter as odd about this car. It just seemed totally out of place. And so operating on a hunch, the hunter would leave the mountain range and head into Danaverk, and he would contact police and he would tell them about this car and where it was located. Because in the hunter's mind, you know, maybe someone had been- Man, I thought it was real, me too. And maybe this car is connected. And so after hearing about the car, the police did not know of any missing person cases that were connected to a car that matched the description the hunter had given. But just to be safe, the police hopped in their vehicles and they drove up into the Ruahin mountain range and they went to the spot the hunter described. And sure enough, off to the side of the road is this parked car and it's still unoccupied. After inspecting the vehicle, the police came to the same conclusion the hunter did, that there was no obvious signs of damage to the car that might have forced someone to <clears> abandon <throat> it. And then when they looked in the they window at the jump, gas gauge, like, they saw I'm the gauge confused. was full. And so the police kind of wandered around the area, kind of doing an initial search to see if maybe the owner of this car was nearby. But, you know, there was no one there. They're in this very isolated part of this wilderness area. And so the police just took down the license plate of the car and they went back to their station. And when they got there, they ran the license plate number and it turned out the car belonged to Jason Chase. When Jason's family was contacted about, you know, why Big is Jason's got him. car Cummy up man in got him. mountains, you know, where's Jason? His family was pretty surprised. They explained to police that Jason had made plans to come visit them around Christmas time. And so they were expecting him to come this way. And, you know, the Ruahine mountain range, it is only eight miles away from Danaverk. So, you know, in theory, maybe he stopped there on the way to their house. But they told police that just didn't make any sense. So as a precaution, the police Sus. decided to launch a search for Jason. And unfortunately, Sus. despite hundreds of people on the ground searching the <clears throat> Ruahine mountain range and helicopters overhead flying all over the place, no trace of Jason was found. And so the official search was called off right before Christmas, but Jason's family and friends, they continued to look for him. And on January 3rd, they would find him. One of the family friends who had agreed to continue looking for Jason after the official search had shut down was a farmer who owned a plane. And on January 3rd, as he did one of his passes over the foothills of the Ruahine mountain range, he looked down and he saw this bright red thing that looked totally out of place. And the pilot couldn't tell what it was. And so he took note of its location. And then when he landed, he passed those coordinates off to the ground team. And so the ground team, they made their way over to this location, which was quite far away from what? where Jason's car had been. <clears throat> and after making their Maybe. way through some very thick brush and some what very happened. steep sections, they eventually walked out to this big open clearing. It was a dry riverbed. And not right a real in front photo. of them, in the middle not of a real it, photo. was the bright red thing. It was Jason's shirt. And Jason was still wearing it. 
He was found lying on his left side with his legs stretched out. He had on his bright red rugby t-shirt, some khaki shorts on, and he had no shoes or socks on. According to the searchers who first saw Jason in this dry creek bed, they would say the scene was very peaceful and it almost looked like Jason had lied down to fall asleep but Jason was not sleeping, he was dead. Jason had no visible injuries and there was no uh. sign of a struggle in the area. In fact, it didn't even look like Jason had been in the wild for very long because his clothes were pristine and despite being barefoot, his feet were in great condition. Despite a lengthy search uh. around the area where his body was discovered, his shoes and socks would not be recovered. The only Forests thing they don't found exist? in the no. area was a water <clears throat> bottle that belonged to Jason. Adding to the mystery of what happened to Jason were the results of his autopsy. The pathologist was unable to find any injuries. Jason also seemed well-nourished because he had food in his stomach and he was hydrated because there was urine in his bladder. His toxicology report also came back negative for all drugs, medications, and a range of common poisons. The <gasps> only odd thing the pathologist found during the autopsy was that Jason had two very small ulcers in his duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. According to this pathologist, what would that these do? type of ulcers only appear from acute stress stress moments before death. However, these ulcers don't indicate what caused the stress. Typically, what? things like severe injury or septicemia, which is blood poisoning, will cause these stress ulcers. But Jason had neither of those. So at the huh? end of the autopsy, the pathologist concluded that Jason had not been the victim of a homicide. He had not committed suicide. He had died from, quote, obscure natural causes. Interestingly, though, the pathologist was what? able to determine with some certainty that Jason died on or around December 30th which means he was alive for the entirety of the official search for him, as well as the bulk of that private search conducted by huh? friends and family. After the autopsy results came out, Jason's case was closed, and his family, despite having lots of unanswered questions, was forced to just move on. 15 years later, the same pathologist that had conducted Jason's autopsy was talking to a colleague about Jason's case. And as he was describing where Jason was found, the colleague suddenly stopped the pathologist and said, wait a minute, I think I know what happened to him. And it would turn out he did. The following is a re radioactivity. Anytime they don't know why he, they die, I feel like it's, it's, it's radioactivity construction of what happened to Jason Chase. On December 13th, 2002, Jason left his home in Gisborne and began heading south towards Danaverk where his family lived. But before he got to his family's home, he took a detour up into the Ruahin mountain range where he eventually parked his car on the side of the road. Once his car was stopped, he got out and collected his backpack and sleeping bag. Those were two items that the water could have been contaminated. I, I, it's true. He could have got his bottle and like grabbed some water from a stream. Were never discovered during the search or after his body was found, <clears throat> but it was later determined they were missing from his vehicle. And so after he has his pack and his sleeping bag, he also grabs a water bottle and then he leaves the main road and begins walking into the he, woods. Making I his guess way he just the decided he to camp. He eventually would find a spot on the side of the mountain that he liked. And so he set up a campsite. What happens next is very confusing because we don't actually know why Jason actually went camping in the first place or when he yeah, intended what to the leave. Hell? But we can make one assumption. Whatever he was doing in the mountains, he planned on wrapping it up in time to still get to his family's house in Danaverk on or before Christmas Day, December 25th. So from December 13th, when he first got out of his car and entered the wilderness until... Why do people camp? Because they enjoy the fear of uh, dying. <clears throat> they enjoy the fear of, uh, you know, being outside, uh, you know, not and, and, and being close to uh, getting killed by anything. You know, they, they like to, to live in the past, you know, in the past where people didn't have homes and they died of disease constantly and uh, weren't really healthy and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, let's go back to that. Don't you guys miss that? Don't you guys miss ha like not having houses? God, me too. Fun times. 
until December 25th, <clears throat> it's believed Jason was by choice out in the wilderness of the Ruahine mountain range. And so as this huge search is launched for him in the area he is in, it's entirely possible that he either did not see any of the searchers. This is a very rugged and heavily for to do drugs in the wild. Bro, if you like are go out to the woods and like do drugs, you're insane. All right? Like if, if you're talking about like acid or some shit, you're crazy, bro. It's not it's not fun. It's not fun. Forested area, and so that's not totally outlandish. Or two, even if he did see the searchers, he may not have recognized that they were looking for him because remember during that time frame he didn't think he was in danger. He was out in the wilderness camping by choice. But sometime around December 25th, or maybe a couple of days before, when he needed to leave and go back to Danavirk to see his family, after packing up his stuff, for whatever reason, he could not get back up to the road where his car was. Either there was some sort of physical boundary, or maybe he got lost. But either way, instead of going back up the mountain, we know Jason actually turned and began going down the mountain, away from the road and away from his car. What if he was tripping? <clears throat> what if he was? That could explain some stuff. Well, actually, didn't they test for drugs? Okay, I'll let, let me give you a little story of, of, of uh, so I've uh, done acid in the woods. And just to tell you how awful it is, <clears throat> I, I remember thinking that, because we had a fire, you know, that was pretty much it. We had a fire. I, I felt, because it was a fire and then it was surrounded by trees. So I kept seeing like past, you know, like where the light ends of the of the fireplace. Uh, I kept seeing like things in the woods, you know, like, like shadows, like running, pa like running back and forth between the trees. I literally felt like if I walked out of that line of light of the fireplace, I would just instantly die. Like I thought I would just die if I walked past that. <clears throat> it was awful. It, it, it was, is awful. <clears throat> I don't recommend ever. I mean, maybe during the day it might be better. I don't know. But um, not fun. Wouldn't recommend it. Like fade into the dark? No, I don't know. Like it's, it's weird. I, I don't really know how to explain it. it. It's weird how to explain being on at like your, your thought process is not normal. Basically, I just thought if I walked out past the light, then, then something would kill me. <clears throat> car it's believed jason actually just decided he would hike his way out of the mountains he was in great shape very healthy guy and he probably figured he could just hike the eight dude fuck dmt uh, i'm my friends did that <clears throat> yeah I'd, I'd never do that they did dmt and uh i it, dude it was scary watching someone be on dmt because like they they just like I don't, I don't really know how to explain it. They just, they don't feel like they're there. Like they're just staring off into space and like that it's, it's weird. It's like, it's like you have a VR headset without having a VR headset on, you know, like, like when you're playing VR and you're like moving your arms around and like, you know, doing stuff in VR, it's like that, but you don't have the headset on. So you're just like, huh. <sighs> It's fucking weird. <laughs> Eight miles it's, to it's kind of funny. And then he could have someone drive him back up and <clears throat> retrieve his car at a later date. But on or around... I, I, shrooms aren't, aren't bad, though, compared to, like, acid or DMT. December 30th, Jason way, was way still out in the mountains. And scary. at this point, he had abandoned his backpack and his sleeping bag and had most likely removed his shoes and socks for reasons we don't know. But he had managed to get much closer to Danavirk. He just had to navigate a few more steep sections and then he'd be home free. And so on or around December 30th, Jason began slowly making his way down the mountainside until he reached a decision point. He found himself standing at the top of two very steep gullies that both would bring him down to a dry oh, no. stretch of riverbed. And so either option worked. <clears throat> it just became a matter of which one is safer.
And so after making his assessment oh, no. about which gully he should take, he made his choice and he made his way down and he reached the dry riverbed. And it was at this point that Jason would have begun to feel a pain in his stomach. And that pain would have gotten worse and worse and worse to the point where Jason likely sat down on this dry riverbed, kind of waiting for the pain to subside. What did he drink? But it wouldn't. It would only intensify. And so as he's sitting there kind of wondering what's going on, his vision would begin to blur and then he would start to struggle breathing. And before he could deal with all of these strange symptoms that were coming on really suddenly, he lost the ability to move his body and he slumped over onto his left side and there he would lay until he died. It would turn out the gully that Jason had chosen to go down when he was standing at the top and he had those two choices, the one he chose that one contained a plant called Urtica ferrix. This plant, oh. which is endemic to New Zealand, grows leaves that are covered in little rigid stinging hairs that contain a toxin called trifidin. And trifidin in high enough doses not only causes stomach pain and blurred vision and trouble breathing, but it also causes <clears throat> total body paralysis and e Why do people like camping? Again, let me reiterate. Why do people like camping? I just want to, I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> oh, yeah, Dara, what, what you said earlier, where was it at? Yeah, I just have a bad fear of not being in my right mind. Yeah, don't, don't ever do it then. <clears throat> Anyone who ever has that fear or, or like the, the fear of that, yeah, don't, don't do it. It, yeah. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, the, don't, don't, just camping's stupid, chat. Camping's dumb. All right. Like, did, appreciate nature by just going to the park, bro. Go to the park. Maybe, like, go on, on a nature trail or, like, maybe go to, like, the mountains and just walk around during the day a little bit. Oh, nature's cool. I'm going to go back to my house where I don't have to worry about dying to a plant that causes paralysis and death. You know? <clears throat> even death. Jason, who according to friends would have known about the dangers this plant posed, likely just <clears throat> didn't see the cluster of plants when he was assessing which gully to go down. And so it wasn't until he was partway down the gully and was in these plants that he realized his mistake, but when he turned to go back up, it was just too steep. And so he was forced to trudge through these toxic oh, plants. Oh, no. And because he was wearing shorts, his lower legs were exposed and they were stung repeatedly. And so he was dealt a lethal dose. The reason the pathologist was not able to identify this as Jason's cause of death is because the stingers on those plants, they don't leave any marks on the human body. And it's poison, trifidin, is so rare that when they sent out that toxicology report, they didn't don't eat it. dirt. They did not test for trifidin. And so it wasn't until 15 years later when the pathologist's colleague heard that Jason years? had been found in the Ruahin Mountains that the colleague said, wait a minute, have you checked for trifidin? Because he knew the Ruahin Mountains were home to clusters of that toxic plant. And so sure enough, they went back to where Jason's body had been found and lining the gully that he... <clears throat> okay, see, this I get. Now, but the thing is, I get that. That there's like when I when I watch those cozy videos of like someone building a, a log cabin in the middle of the woods, I feel like I would I would vibe with that, bro. I wouldn't mind like just like the nice log cabin out in the middle of the woods because it's a cabin. You know, you got a little bit of protection. You know, got a little bit of safety. You got a little bit of security. Not a fucking tent. You know. No, not a tent. No, that's not camping. No, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's not camping. That's called living. That that that's what that's called. That's called enjoying life and living smart because we are humans. You know, we're humans. We we evolved to the point where we realized, hey, staying outside at night without any protection or a roof over our head, kind of dangerous, bro. Maybe we shouldn't do that. <clears throat> Sleep in your car. <clears throat> No, I'm just going to sleep in my house. What about going to a public campsite? Man, that's a little bit different. RV, yeah, RV camping. I'm, dude, I would RV camp. Actually, me and my wife were going to do that last year. We were going to travel uh, 
all the way to uh, Maine and uh, and take the RV the whole way. We were gonna do that. Uh, RV camping, I'd, I'm I'm down with that. I'd do that for sure. But yeah, the thing is, if I have a a a a, a place to sleep where there's protection, let's go. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> but I ain't sleeping outside in a tent. He had come down for dozens and dozens of those plants. <clears throat> So, God, that sucks, though. That sucks. That's such an unfortunate way to go, dude. But again, a lot of these stories, it you have that concept of why. Why did he go camping? Why did he go down the mountain? Why didn't he just go back to his car? Uh, why did he leave his car in the first place? Also, the dude who decided to go back to Death Valley for some titty. Well, why? You know, and also, why didn't someone just drop him off at the nudist area? Like, it, it's it's so confusing. Now it's time to walk away. I hope you enjoyed your stay. Did you laugh or cry or maybe subscribe? I'll thank you either way. You know I will miss you. Turn. Tell your friend or your mother to get me more views, please.